My name is Jonathan Novick. I've been with a company called Audio Precision for the last 11 years. How many people here have heard of Audio Precision? Okay, a few of you haven't. For, th for those of you that haven't, uh, we make one and only thing, one and only one thing, and that's an audio analyzer. We make many different types of audio analyzers, but for the last 30 years, we've made the highest precision audio analyzers on the market. So chances are most of the devices that you use at one time or another were tested on our products, probably your cell phones, the chips inside your cell phones were probably tested on our stuff. Your car radio was probably tested on our stuff. So we do all things audio. Um, so I get around quite a bit, a little bit about my background. I'm an electrical engineer. I used to work for another test and measurement company, Agilent, uh, before I joined Audio Precision. Uh, I also used to do RF and microwave radar work back in the day. So I s still know a few things from engineering school, even though I sold my soul to, to sales and marketing years ago. Um, so I'm also kind of an audiophile, or at least I used to be. I'm, I am a member of the LA Orange County Audio Society, which is, I guess, the biggest one around. And uh, I used to really be into it when I had time to listen to music. That's the curse of my job. I deal with people that make some of the finest instrument, you know, uh, playback equipment in the world, and I have no time to enjoy it. Um, but my objectives today are pretty simple. We're going to try to do uh, three things. One, to make the scientists more skeptical of specs, because you know there's always this tension between the scientific community and the audiophile community, where the scientific community says, well, if the specs are the same, it sounds the same. We've probably all heard that comment. And then uh, I also want to make the audiophiles more appreciative of the uh, specifications, because specifications can be very good. And I'll show you where they work and where they don't. And really what I want to encourage is more dialogue between the scientific community and the audiophile community. Because a lot of people that come to this show will say, I can hear things, but the specs look the same. And you're right. And I'm going to show you some of the things that you can hear that there are no specs for. So this is something we really don't want to see. In, um, you know. <laughs> This is the kind of the scientific viewpoint of it. Hey, it's all perfect. You know, look, just look at the specs. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do now, and just shout out some things. If, if you have a microphone on your table, you can use this. But I just want you to shout, shout out a few terms. Okay, first, what are some adjectives that you see when you read a review of gear? Anyone want to volunteer a few adjectives? Musical. Crisp. OK. What? Musical, accurate. I, accurate, silky, transparent. what? Transparent. transparent, warm, coherent, coherent. holographic. holographic. Bright. What's it? Bright. Okay. Dull. Dull. Yes. <laughs> laid back. Uh, yes. Laid back. Okay. So you get the idea. A lot. There are a lot of adjectives uh, that we can use. Now let's look at the other side. What are some of the measurements that we see when we look at a spec sheet for gear. THD, THD. Signal, to noise. signal to noise ratio, SPL, SPL. Frequency, response. frequency response. OK, so we, we got a bunch of them. You notice that the same words weren't used on the, in both of those lists. Um, and I know my equipment pretty well. We've been around for 30 years. We have lots of different products. I know my competitors. There are some seats up front. Um, and I know my competitors' products pretty well. And none of us produce any graph with any of the adjectives you gave me in that first. So then what are audio specifications? Well, what they are is an objective abstraction used to infer a subjective performance level. OK? So let's put it to the extreme. My lady goes to the flea market and finds this old picture frame and comes back and says, and this is dangerous because she's asking an engineer to find some artwork to match her picture frame. OK, now, I like specs. So I need some specs for this artwork. How big is the picture frame? So she gives me a size. Hmm, metric. Hmm. I'll figure that out. And then I, I need some more information, OK? What style? You know, 
So oil painting, okay, I'm not much of an art guy, that's why I went to engineering school, um, you know, but I can probably tell the difference between watercolor, pastels, and may maybe I get oil and acrylic mixed up. All right, but I need some more information. Style, you know, it says shabby chic. So I, basically I know she wants something that looks old and degraded, but she wants to pay extra for it. Um, <laughs> all right. But I really need something more to go on. So she says, well, oh wait, I you know you like specs. L let me go into my digital camera. Here's, here's an exposure histogram, and, and, and this is of a picture I really like. OK, now from, from this list of specs, what I really am looking for is I'm looking for, will she like it? Will it enhance the living room? And is it worth 50 bucks? Because I all know, you know, we all know, I can get dogs playing poker for 60. So, you know. <laughs> all right. So now, th now this is actually a very famous frame. And the picture that goes in that frame is this one. So let's turn it around. Let's say you commissioned Leonardo da Vinci to paint Mona Lisa. What would the specs look like for that painting? Well, she should have a smile. Well, not kind of, not kind of a smile, maybe a smirk. Her eyes should follow you around the room. She would kind of be kind of dark. A little bit of cleavage, not too much. You know, I mean, how would you describe what you want using specifications or a piece of art? And that's what we're doing. We're trying to do, get subjective enjoyment out of gear, and we're trying to use technical specifications to describe it. So let's take the critical view here. There's no spec that tells you how something sounds. You know, the, you know he's, we heard all those adjectives before. What's the scale for those adjectives? There is no scale defined. We also know we use test tones, you know, like sine waves, to make measurements. And those don't mimic music or speech. And we all know this. There are good products out there, but their specs don't look very good. But they sound great. They make us happy. And there are bad products that look great on paper. And then there's this other factor about manufacturers that are a little bit deceptive. Okay, that's the critical view. Where do specs really help us out? Well, they do quantify the fitness of a product to an application. And um, so I like using car analogies. You go to fill up your car, and there's a sign on your gas tank that says, right by your filler cap, and it says, this car takes 87 octane fuel. That's the spec, the octane rating. And so we go up to a pump, we assume 87 octane, good enough. Now, you know, Chevron will tell you that their Tecrolene is better than Arco's, whatever. Okay? They do help us simplify evaluations. You, you read a car and driver magazine or something like that, and they'll list, they'll rate six sedans or sports cars, and at the end of the article, they'll have all these specs all next to each other. It's very easy to look at specs and make a comparison. We also, and this is, can be dangerous, we assume that when you use specs, you're making a fair and objective decision. And of course, we all joke about, oh, we sent the man uh, to the moon going to the lowest bidder that met the specs. You know, so maybe it works in some cases. Now, I came from the defense industry, and let me tell you, when they come, when you have specs in the defense industry, they send somebody out to your uh, place and watch you make the measurements. So th there is a lot of fairness when you do that kind of policing. Um, specs also provide some consistency in the descriptions. I mean, going back to car analogies, I, I used to drive some slow cars in college, and you know, I thought always thought my speedometer should read four longs per fortnight, but. Um, <laughs> But, you know, miles per hour, you know, is a nice consistency. So let's go back to what are audio specs are good for. Well, they are a reasonable indicator of subjective performance. If you look at a frequency response and it's all over the map, you, you know it's not going to sound very good. All right? But you really have to you look at a lot of specs to get a, an idea of reasonable. Bob, there's uh, some seats up front. Um, they are a fantastic indicator of production consistency. So you've designed a widget, and 
the, your uh, widget has been tested fully on the bench. You know it's going to perform well as long as the parts go in it correctly and the parts are measured correctly. So audio specs can be great in a production line. And you don't have to look at everything. You don't have to use the same degree of analysis to determine that something came off the production line okay as you do to determine if you designed it okay. They're great for establishing design criteria. So if you're building a speaker, the speaker's gonna handle a certain amplifier power. And so you need to say, oh, the speaker can handle so many watts RMS, you look for an amplifier that can produce that level. That's what specs are really good at. And they help sell products. I mean, go, let's go back to cars again. Tesla has the latest model with ludicrous mode. And before that, they had insane mode. What's the difference? About four or five tenths of a second in zero to 60 time. But, you know, it's the spec that sells the product. And of course, you know, you buy the Lamborghini that goes 200 miles per hour, and then you sit on a freeway in LA at 15 miles an hour. But they buy it because what the car can do, what the spec says, they'll never drive it that fast. Um, also, specs, you know, we as customers, we want to know things. So, this is where it gets a little bit crazy. I bought a cheap home receiver, oh, I want to say maybe 10 years ago. And I open up the manual, and it says audio section, minimum RMS output power, 95 watts. Great, I've got a 95 watt per channel receiver. Until I read the next line, it says dynamic power, anywhere from 135 to 240 watts. Even better, bigger number. Then it says, maximum useful output power, 135 watts. Well, those two numbers match. And then it says, maximum output power. Notice it doesn't use the word useful. And it says 145 watts. So at this point, I'm a little bit confused, but I'm assuming those extra 10 watts weren't useful watts. <laughs> um, and, and then it says, uh, dynamic headroom, 1.4 dB. Now, I'm an engineer. I still remember what a dB means. It's a ratio, but it doesn't tell me a ratio of watt, but it does say USA and Canada models. So I assume that maybe the USA model is 1.4 dB more powerful because the exchange rate or something like that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. All right. Um, and then it says IEC output power, 105 watts. Okay, now this is in the manual. So the questions you ask is, which one of these is correct? Which one is relevant to me? And which one was advertised? And it's probably that 240 watt number that was advertised because that was the biggest one on there. At least if I went into Best Buy or something, that's what they'd probably tell me. Now the real truth of the matter is all of those numbers are correct. So why do we, you know, the beauty of standards is we have so many to choose from and those were all measured to different standards. So we have the Federal Trade Commission, and this is, uh, it's actually in the federal uh, code, how you measure a two-channel amplifier. The government says, you shall do it this way. And if you don't, you can supposedly get fined. Now, back in 2008, I actually met the guy that, at the FTC that is in charge of that standard. I said, when was the last time you had someone complain? This is in 2008. He said, it's probably been 10 years. The standard went into place in 74. They started working on it in 69. Back then, you had amplifiers that people would advertise high power ratings, and people would try to run them at high power, and you'd end up with a piece of carbon on your shelf. And you know, it was a consumer fraud issue at the time. But what's happened since then is manufacturers got smarter. Most consumer amplifiers have a nice protection schemes built into them so you don't end up with carbon. You may not get the power out that you want, but you don't end up with a fire hazard and all this lost money. You can still do something with it. So uh, an older standard, Institute of High Fidelity, doesn't exist anymore. People like to use it, though, because it's a simpler test than the FTC test. That's why its power rating numbers were higher. And then the Japanese have their way that they like to do things. And there's, we have the Consumer Electronics Association. Before that, the Electronic Industries Alliance. That's on more of the mass consumer side. They have their way of doing it. And I'll have to come clean. I actually sit on the standards board for the Consumer Electronics Association. So I, I do uh, 
worked on a couple of speaker standards. There's an amplifier standard coming out that we're working on now just to match your amplifiers to speakers a little bit better than the old standard did. And, um, and then the Europeans have their own standards as well that they like to use. So, and this is just for power ratings, okay? They all do it pretty much the same way. They say increase the signal level into the device and measure the distortion as THD plus N out of the device. And you usually end up with a curve like this where the first part of the region at low levels, noise is dominating this ratio. And then at some point you get to the onset of clipping and the distortion starts to rise very quickly. And at some point on this, you say, this is my rated output power. And you say, hey, you know, let's say it's a 0.1% distortion. And whatever that output level is, you say, that's my rated output power. But if I wanted to say a higher number, like when you look at uh, car stereos or you look at, uh, it was great when PC speakers were really popular, you know, they'll show these great numbers way up here at 20% distortion. Okay, yeah, they just chose a point higher on the curve. So what's the difference in all the power standards if they're using basically the same technique? The differences are the ambient test conditions. Uh, you know, sometimes they don't define it. So you, you want to, you know, put something on ice, get it nice and cool before you make your power measurement, guess what? You'll see higher power. You can, pre, um, the FTC and a few others require preconditioning of the device. That means get the device warmed up before you do a measurement. There's the power source. This is a big thing in car amplifiers. The average car amplifier is rated at 14.4 volts. Well, most cars, are the average voltage is really going to be closer to 13.8 volts. Why do they measure at 14.4? Because it looks a little bit better. And before they had the standard that said 14.4, they were rating them at 20 volts. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, and I'm co-chair of the standard that's we're the committee that's going to rework that standard. Um, uh, output load conditions, like we saw in one of those tests, they show 2, 4, 6, and 8 ohm load conditions. So that'll change output power. Uh, the duration of the test. Some people say you have to hold the power level for uh, several minutes. Some people say for several microseconds. As a matter of fact, it gets really bad with powered speakers because there is no standard that's accepted for powered speakers. And I was talking to some manufacturer of a pro-powered speaker, and they said, oh yeah, our test is pretty simple. We just run a pulse through it, and then we measure the peak voltage of the pulse, even if it's only there at that peak for one microsecond. And then we use Ohm's law to come up with the power level. So, um, and then the configuration of the test gear is also going to be very important in how you uh, determine uh, what the power is. is. Uh, so. Let's talk about, quickly about specsmanship. We know it's out there. And uh, it's really, the three ways to look at it. Technical deception masked in objectivity. And there are a lot of specs out there that you see a number on the page and the number is meaningless because they don't give you extra information out there. Um, or I can say it's a more skillful thing. It's the art of enhancing a product's appeal with incomplete data. Oh, you know, which is really clever technique to fool the unknowing. So I really would hope that after this, you'd all be a little bit more knowledgeable and wouldn't be subject to specsmanship. Now, I was at a trade show a few years ago. This is maybe five years ago now. And this product is still on the market, I checked. Uh, this company comes out, uh, and they're importing product from China. And uh, through a friend of a friend, I knew their sales guy. And he says, hey, Jonathan. You got to check out our new amp. 300 watts per channel, one rack space high. It's a great little amp. And I said, let me see the specs. And they actually showed it was an EIA test, which is not a very uh, difficult test compared to the FTC method. But uh, EIA, OK, uh, one kilohertz, not a broadband power test. All right, it said that. And then it goes on to say, well, it was 2,100 watts in bridge mono and 3,000 watts max. Okay, so a few red flags go off. Okay, first one is the amp wasn't even rated into 4 ohms, so how did it do bridge mono into 8? And then, of course, 
2100 violates Ohm's law, it should be 1200 into bridge mono. But of course, that's just a convenient transposition of the one and the two, a fortuitous one for their marketing guy. But I can let him slide, but then I asked to look at the manual, and, and the amp wasn't even configurable into bridge mono. <laughs> So I pointed that out to the guy, and he goes, ooh. So uh, they eliminated the bridge mono spec from future specs. They still quote the 3,000 watts max. Of course, that doesn't show you a distortion, a duration, or a load. And it, you know, normally when I see those kind of numbers, there's a three-letter acronym, WLS, that should be on the spec. And that stands for when lightning strikes. <laughs> so. Um, so that's what I assume that 3,000 number is. So, so this all came to me about eight years ago when I was attending an audio engineering society uh, conference. By the way, I'm a, I, said, I think I told you I'm from the scientific side. I'm governor of the audio engineering society. I'm past vice president and all that. So I I'm, I'm really like what the AES does. And then a fellow of the AES is individual Alex Weishvila, who's one of the best transducer designers I know. The guy is absolutely brilliant. He gives this talk called The Assessment of Nonlinearities in Audio from Harmonic Distortion to Perceptual Models. And in it, he gave a little presentation where some high distortion sounded OK and some low distortion sounded bad. And then he said, well, you know, bad distortion numbers are meaningless. And this guy, you know, PhD, a lot more educated than I am, a lot more established. So I go home that night. And I say to myself, why am I in the testing business? I felt like a snake oil salesman at that time. And I really, I was bummed. But I woke up the next day, good night's sleep helped. And I remembered this. If it measures well but sounds bad, you're measuring the wrong thing. And that was a quote from another AES fellow, Richard Heiser. And I said, ah, what was Alex doing wrong? So I had to do my own experiments. And we're going to do the experiment live today. So, you know, I mentioned this curve and, you know, you can choose any point off that curve depending on what power level you want to report, basically. So let's play some games. We'll, we'll do it ourselves. Probably most of you are familiar with this song. I think it was a Grammy winner for Steely Dan, Hey 19. And I am going to switch to the analyzer now and we are going to do some listening tests. So. This is my marketing slide. I have to do this slide, otherwise they won't pay for me to go back home. Um, so this over here is one of our mid-end, uh, mid-range analyzers. We actually have three of them here. We have a suite up in the other, uh, the atrium area, I guess, suite 408, where we have this, our high-end analyzer, the 555, and our entry-level analyzer, the 515. All there, you want to bring some gear up, we'll test it for you. But uh, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play some WAV files out of the analyzer. I have got here one of the most unique items in the building today. This item does nothing but generate distortion, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> so we are going to do some tests with this. I have some lots of knobs on here. The TSA didn't seem to mind. Um, <laughs> And we are going to just listen to stuff. And then I've got a buffered output off to the speakers so we can hear what's going on. So let me get this thing hooked up. And uh, OK. And so what I'm going to do now is, uh, let's see. We're just going to listen we're just going to listen to the music. You know, these Meyer set speakers are pretty good sounding PA speakers, but we have no idea what the rest of the system is. I just want to hear how it sounds. This is in pass through mode, okay? So 
that's a 24 second uh, clip of that song, just keeps repeating. And you notice uh, I'm showing you the waveform that's coming in. Of course, you can't tell anything from that. And that's by choice because I don't want you to know what I'm doing. Um, <coughs> so we're going to listen to our first test. And what I want you to do is I want you to listen with your eyes closed because I don't want you to be influenced by the people around you. And I want you to raise your hand when the distortion becomes objectionable. Now, there is distortion anyhow in this system. I mean, this is made with the finest uh, TLO-72s um, that Radio Shack sells. And um, so not when you say, think you hear distortion, but when it really becomes objectionable. And just raise your hand. And I'm going to stop the test when about half the hands are in the air. And so I'll go to my next. Uh, Let's see. Um, turn it on here. Way back when in '67. Okay, close your eyes. I was a dandy, yeah, my kind. Sweet things from Boston, so young. I'm going to stop the test there. A bunch of hands just went up. All right. Sweet thing. So all I did is turn off the speaker output. I'm not touching any. I left the controls where they were. Anyone want to guess what kind of dis, what kind what level of distortion that was? Throw out some numbers. Twenty percent. Five percent. Fifteen. What? Ten. Okay. He says higher. That's very vague. <laughs> you, you, you know, I wish I, I wish I could do, I wish I could do lottery tickets. My number was higher. <laughs> um, all right. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm not changing the output level of the analyzer. All I'm going to do is put a sine wave through it now. Ooh, thirty-five percent. You know, and, and you know, most of us here know good gear from bad gear. Are, are any of you surprised that it was that high? Well, yeah, because uh, with, with real, real tape decks, you get up about uh, uh, seven tenths of a percent. It starts to become very, very audible. Yeah, and, and so the comment here was real to real decks at over seven tenths of a percent becomes very audible. And actually, well, we'll talk more about it. I don't want to spoil the surprise because I'll tell you. You know, actually, you can hear 1% distortion very easily, but I won't tell you why you didn't hear it in this case. What I'm going to do now is a slightly different distortion. And uh, we're going to play the same game again. We're listening to the music. 67. And I'm going to dial in the distortion and close your eyes. I your hands was a dandy, yeah, my kind. Sweet things from Boston, so young and wheeling. Way back when, in 67. Okay, all right. All right. Did that sound a little bit worse than the previous distortion? Yeah. yeah. OK. So that other one was 35. How bad do you think this was? Any guesses? 17. 17. <laughs> I like that. Very specific. It said another two for 17. Do we have three for 17 going once? <laughs> What's that? 34.8. What? 34.8. 34.8. Oh, this is great. 1701. The price is right. <laughs> One. Ooh. All right. Let's just switch to the sine wave here. And the answer is oh, let's go to the 3.8.
And that sounded worse than 35. So I just recreated the test that Alex Boishvillo did back in 2007. He did it with pre-recorded music that he manipulated in MATLAB. He didn't send it through a real circuit. And so I just did it with a real circuit. So what does that tell me? Well, uh, OK. So we're back to this. Uh, well, the first case, my control case, was an undistorted signal. And I, this is the time domain waveform. And you can see you know, the peaks are all at different levels and whatnot. And if I look at the circuit one, all the peaks are now at the same level. That was hard clipping. So those peaks were clipping at 35%. But what was happening down here? There was no clipping there. That's why it didn't sound so bad. All right. Now, this is zoomed in on the time scale. This is the second circuit. Notice how when the signal goes from low to high and high to low, it kind of lingers in the middle there. That's crossover distortion. That's like an AB amplifier that isn't well biased. OK. So what, what's the problem here? Well, we tested with sine waves, not music. So if we look at music in the time domain, it looks like this. OK. Now, I'm sure you all recognize that you know, the other song I was showing you, you know, if I go back, this was clearly Steely Dan. And I'm sure some of you in the room recognize that as Paul Anka. But, um, <laughs> um, but this is music, and this is a sine wave. Now, it really doesn't make a difference if whether this is Paul Anka's sine wave or Steely Dan's sine wave. But, you know, they're pretty much all the same. Um, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to show you the probability density function of voltage over time. So basically, if I turn this graph up on its end and say, how much time does the music spend at a certain voltage level? And music, you're going to see a distribution something like this, where most of the time it's centered around the zero crossing, not the peaks. Whereas a sine wave is actually moving slowest at the peaks. So it's very different. So let's look at that again. This is where crossover distortion happens. This is where clipping happens. So from this, you can say, well, maybe we need to talk about the density of distortion. And there are, there are tests actually used for speech in telecommunications. There's a test called Polka, which looks at the density of distortions. And it doesn't quite do this exact test, but it looks at four different types of distortions that you find in telecommunication systems. And they look at density of distortions. So you could say, well, maybe I need to do a time averaging of distortions. I don't know. But clearly, there's a difference, and this is why we see the difference in those two. Uh, so at this point in the talk, we can say that, um, oh, you know what? I want to do one more test before I'm Let's see. I am. OK. OK, we're going to do one more listening test. And this one's a little bit more difficult. So. I was. I'm going to be playing with the levels, so as I increase the distortion, I have to lower the output level. So you hear the level move a little bit. Don't worry about that. Just when it becomes objectionable, raise your hand. Way back when, in 67, I was a dandy, yeah, my kind. Sweet things from Boston, so young. Okay, um, it's very subtle, right? Here, I don't think half the hands were up yet, but I'm just going to go in and out of bypass mode. Okay, so this is the distorted signal right now. Not distorted. I'm just going in and out. 
What are you hearing different? The highs? The highs, right. Right, okay. So anyone want to guess how much that distortion was? What level that was at? Any 1701s or? <laughs> Less than 100. Less than 100. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, his hey 19. I, I like that. Um, and and uh, it, it wouldn't be too bad, you know, but 0.3%? Hold on a second. Hold on. Uh, hmm. It says, I'm not sure what my uh, filtering is here. So let's go back and see what my filtering is. And, oh, it says 90 kilohertz. Hmm. Let, oh, I see. Fi I'm only measuring at 500 hertz here. So let's turn that on again. And let's change that to 1 kilohertz like I did the other measurements. Oh, it went up. Wait then, that was weird change with frequency. Let's see what happens if I go to 10 kilohertz. I went up again a little bit. Let's go back to 800 hertz. Hmm. The distortion is dependent on the frequency. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm going to keep it at this frequency for a bit, and I'm just going to change the level. Well, the distortion went up with level, like you know, it normally does. So I can change the level that distortion moves quite a bit, but it doesn't seem to be in clipping because clipping would go up a lot higher as as a, and it's I'm going to go crazy with the distortion and it seems to be peaking at around 12 and change. E even though I'm going to some pretty high levels of distortion here uh input levels here. So that's weird. So let, let's go back to the uh Back to the presentation here. Okay. So what we were seeing here is a case where the THD, when measured as a ratio, uh, was doing something like this. It was it was going up and actually went down a little bit. There was a uh, but uh, whereas the standard circuit. We had hard clipping. Uh, in the crossover, we had this. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a little bit out of line here. Um, I, I was premature with, with this last distortion test. Let me just finish up between the hard clipping and the crossover. So the crossover distortion circuit, looked, the THD level looked something like that, whereas the hard clipping circuit looked like that. Now that's as a ratio. Sometimes you just want to look at the residual distortion without comparing it to the overall signal. And here, the hard clipping circuit had a high background noise, and then the distortion climbed like a rock when it hit clipping. Whereas in the case of the crossover distortion, it just kept rising, rising, rising. Now that information isn't obvious when you look at a single number spec. The graphs, graphs tell you a lot more. And where do we listen? Do we listen at maximum output power? I haven't done that since I listened to a factory radio in a 1970s vintage car. You know, they, those things were rated about three watts, and if you opened up the window, you had it on max output. Um, these days, there's usually ample power. We normally listen somewhere down here, all right? And no one publishes distortion numbers at, let's say, quarter watt output or one watt output. Now. If you go back to the FTC power rating, where they say the distortion number is based on so many minutes of preconditioning and the output is held for so long at a certain power level, it's a very good spec in that it taxes the amplifier quite a bit. But what most people have forgotten is it says the number you publish, you have to be better than that number from one quarter watt output all the way to maximum power and you listen down low. And that's the only spec for power I know that has that requirement, that you hold that level regardless of where you are along the performance curve. So th that's one reason why I like the FTC. A lot of manufacturers hate it because if you remember from that manual I showed you, it was the lowest number reported. But it, that's one of the reasons. 
So uh, lessons learned so far, not all distortion sounds alike. The graphs tell you a lot more than the specs do. Um, you should measure where you listen. And of course, if you're going to set a limit for the specs, set it below the limit of audibility for, uh, for that annoying distortion. So then we did the second test. And we saw that when I did the measurements, as I changed the frequency from 500 hertz to 10 kilohertz, the distortion rose. So here's a family of curves. And you see distortion rises earlier um, at, as the frequency changes. Uh, and then as I change level, the distortion changed. But it peaks at around, in both cases, the distortion peaks at around 12%. Uh, now, does anyone know what kind of what that was? I guess it says there. It's slew rate limiting. Now, if you read the audiophile magazines back in the 80s, like I used to, everything, every amplifier, all they seemed to care about was slew rate limiting, slew rate limiting, slew rate limiting. And if you heard it yourself, it's very subtle. It kind of sounds like someone put a blanket over the speaker. It, it's, compared to crossover distortion, it's really not that bad at all. Matter of fact, it's very natural sounding because if I had this speaker playing music and then I walked out into the hallway, I'd lose the high frequencies anyhow. And we, we experience that kind of stuff every day. We don't say, oh, the speaker's crap because you're in the other room. So slew rate limiting, it exists, but it's not the terrible thing that people uh, used to say it is. And I can do more stuff. Um, there are things called waiting filters that you can put. So I can go back and play with the analyzer and get different distortion numbers. And so uh, let's. Uh, so here I see some distortion number. And now I'm going to throw in a weighting filter. And the distortion changed. And now I'm going to change the frequency that I'm measuring over. And uh, say, I'm only going to look out to 2 kilohertz. Oh, OK. There we go. Amplifier's doing, you know, my circuit's doing much better now. I haven't changed anything in the circuit. I just changed the analyzer configuration. It's very tricky, right? If I'm playing the game of specsmanship, I can get any number I want by changing how wide the bandwidth is of the analyzer. So when we go back to looking at that, this is a uh, curve of different common weighting filters. We often see the ANSI A weighting filter used. And that filter is pretty much centered at 1 kilohertz. So it doesn't look at distortion produced outside of that range. So if you're sweeping frequency and looking at a distortion versus frequency, you better not have that A weighting filter turned on because you're not going to see the distortion outside of the 1 kilohertz range. It's the filters just filtering out all those distortion components. So there are different weighting ranges, but usually if you're looking at a versus frequency, you really want to use an unweighted, uh, an unweighted measurement. So with this knowledge, you can kind of see now, when you look at an amplifier specification, and it says, oh, this is 0.1% distortion, and it doesn't tell you what frequency it was measured at, and it doesn't tell you how the analyzer was configured, you don't really know what that measurement means. So um, also, this area here, it, it actually is undefined. And you can put a brick wall filter there and get lower numbers. but. Um, so additional lessons, you really need to test over the entire operational bandwidth of, of the device. That means frequency bandwidth, power bandwidth, um, and be very mindful of how the analyzer was configured. And if the uh, specification that you read doesn't tell you over what bandwidth it was measured, you don't really know what that means. So now this is, real, this is one of my favorite slides of this presentation. Okay, I like to do my own tests. And, and you know, with these modern analyzers, I can capture waveforms. And waveforms can sometimes tell you things that specs can't. So I have this burst going through this amplifier. I think this was the same amplifier that I showed the power ratings for. And the instant that the burst comes on, the capacitors of the power supply are nice and charged, we see this nice square response. 
Now the amplifier in the long term ha has a limiter built in to prevent it from overheating. And that's what we see here. But what's interesting is this 120 hertz ripple in the transient condition. So between the instantaneous state and the uh, continuous state, where it's this transient ripple. Now, if I just look at the level, that's about 20 dB below the main signal level, and it's not harmonically related to the signal. Now, I've probably shown this slide to 500 AES members, and every time I ask, does anyone believe that this is audible? They go, yeah, that would be audible. Then I ask the question, which spec measures this problem? And Bob, you've written the book on power amplifiers. Tell me. What? Usually not tested for. I, I don't know if you heard his answer, but he says it's usually not tested for. There is no spec that shows this particular problem. And in fact, it gets more interesting because one of my customers is a guitar amp manufacturer, and he had to make a solid state version of an old tube amplifier. And he said, I'm trying to come up with a transfer function for the tube amplifier. And then the weirdest thing, I found out that the characteristic sound was the power supply ripple coming out th to the speaker when you hit the amplifier really hard. He had to duplicate that sound of a bad power supply. <laughs> and so, uh, so sometimes that's desirable. If, you know, guitar amps and guitar pedals, you're all about distortion. But in, in this case, uh, you know, for in this market, we're trying to do playback and we're trying to do it accurately. So, this is just one thing that I happen to capture. And it leads me to the question, how many other transitory conditions exist in music and in when we listen uh, every day that we don't even look for? And, I, and it's my belief that a lot of these things that exist, and if we start, if we hear it, then we can start capturing, and I, I believe that if we can see it in the waveform, that we should be able to see anything that we hear in the waveform. We just have to know what to look for and how to analyze for it. Then once we know we can capture it, we can start characterizing it. So this is bad, but I don't know the degree of bad, right? So uh, Bob, yes. I might comment that um, one thing that tends to bring this up is if you do 50 hertz full power THD and look at it on a spectrum analyzer, you'll see the 120 hertz oh. there along with the 50, 50 right. hertz THD. Right. So what Bob was saying is one of his ways to test for this kind of problem is to use a 50 hertz test that 50 lower frequencies will drain the power supply faster than it resupplies the uh, caps. So that's a good way to test for that. But I've talked to lots of amp manufacturers, and they all have their own secret sauce that they look for. A lot of them use oscilloscopes for certain conditions. But no one's ever really said, this is a standard spec. Let, as an industry, let's agree we should all test for this. Everyone says, you know what, this is our secret sauce. This is what makes us sound good. I'm not going to share this with my competitors. And that's the problem with standards. You know, there, there are three reasons that you get involved in standards. And one of them is to create a standard that puts your company at an advantage. The other is to block a standard that puts your company at a disadvantage. And then the reason that I participate, which is I like to hobnob with people that are smart enough to create standards. So. <laughs> um, so, you know, so why do the specs uh, don't, why don't they tell us? Well, we seem to be stuck on sine waves. And there's a good reason for it. Sine waves are the only test signal that can be calibrated for. You know, it, all the energy is in one frequency band. We can look for that. We can a, use an AC voltmeter and we can measure a level. It's the only, you know, we, there's no such thing as the calibrated Steely Dan song. You know, Roger Nichols might, like to disagree with that, but um, so anyhow, uh, so that's one reason why we use it. Two, we've been using them for decades. Hewlett Packard's first product was a sine wave oscillator in 1939, right? Used in uh, creating Fantasia. Disney was their first customer. Um, all audio analyzers know how to measure a sine wave. When you start getting into some fancier tests, well, the, the old analog audio analyzers aren't usually up for the task. So there are better tests available, but as you see, it requires test with a dollar sign equipment, and a lot of people don't want to make that investment. And the investment actually isn't as bad as it used to be. 
uh, you know, back when I started the company, the typical analyzer we sold was over $25,000. And these days, we sell a lot of analyzers for under $7,000. So, and it, it's arguably faster and not quite as accurate, but, uh, you know, we still sell the higher end ones too. I mean, we have to feed each other, you know. So, um, but th this is the real issue. Consensus is hard to generate. What test is going to be agreeable, is applicable to hi-fi systems, to pro audio systems, things like that. <coughs> but there are other distortion tests that are available today. Twin tone intermodulation tests, they're used in broadcasting quite a bit. Um, and they're very good for uncovering certain things. There is a dynamic intermodulation distortion, or also known as transient intermodulation distortion, which is basically, this is not Bart Simpson in profile. This is a square wave mixed with a sine wave producing this sharp transient, and you look for certain harmonics, and you get a number there. This is a burst test, which is actually kind of nice. It allows manufacturers to uh, get higher numbers, May, this burst test is called CEA 2006. It's a car audio test. And it's basically 120 beats per minute uh, with a 20 dB crest factor. And, uh, but it's only a 4% duty cycle. Maybe not be representative of music, but it, I can argue both ways for and against that as being a relevant spec for output power. So those are some standard tests that are out there. We also have something called a multi-tone test that's been around for 20 years. And multitones look like noise, which actually look more like music than a sine wave. And they actually sound like a pipe organ, oftentimes. And it measures total distortion, which if you see, this is a spectrum of the multitone. This is about 30 tones here. So you're looking at the harmonics generated from each one of these individual tones, plus the intermodulation of each tone mixed with all thir the other 30. So you get a number that's called a total distortion. And since there's no standard for tonal content, the results can vary. So if I want to use 30 tones versus 5 tones, I will see a different total distortion number. And I would expect that, but there's no standard for what you should do. And that's part of the problem. And that's one of the reasons why people that use multitones only use them internally, often for production tests. It has some nice speed advantages for production testing. So. Uh, you know, a lot of the parts that we have out there have something called an op amp in that little IC called an op amp. Now, if I'm choosing an op amp and I go to TI and say, give me the data sheet for your op amp, I will get a nice booklet, basically, and in that booklet will be 40 graphs, and each graph will have multiple traces, all these different test conditions, measuring this versus that versus the other thing, and then somehow, this is how the parts that go into the device are tested. And somehow, when we get the device, the, the finished product, we have like three or four specs. Now, you know, do finished products really require any less degree of testing? And the answer is no. So the question is, what should be communicated to the consumer? And that's the big debate. You know, and the marketing team will say, well, they don't understand that, so let's not communicate it. And let's just communicate what makes us look good. And that's really the state of the market. So what the specs don't tell you, they don't give you the performance under all conditions. Um, and we can see a graph is worth a lot more than a single data point. And we need to start reporting common conditions, not just maximum power things, when, at least when it comes to distortion. Um, we don't, the specs don't tell you performance under transient conditions. And you know, sine waves and continuous signals are not like music and speech. So we know that, so it's not telling us that. And we also don't know how these numbers relate to our enjoyment. In a one case, that 3.5% distortion sounded a lot worse than 12% distortion because we don't have a good correlation. Hey, Brent. Um, so, uh, you know, not all distortion is created equal. So there's more work that can be done here. So I will like to end on a more positive note. There is some hope. Um, the existing measurements are very good if you look at them in their entirety. And if we as a community start asking for more, maybe manufacturers will start giving us some more. Um, 
The modern audio analyzers that capture waveforms can give us a lot more insight as to what's going on. And there are new standards under development. You know, getting consensus on them is something else, but there is work being done, and I would encourage more people to get involved in this work. Um, so the good news is, you know, people like audio precision, a lot of times in the past when I used to come to this show, and I've been coming here several times and to other audiophile shows, people say, oh, audio precision, oh, you're the scientist guys, we don't believe you. So there's more collaboration. This is the second, we we're at the Newport show in May, we're, he we're here now. There's more collaboration going on. So that's a, that's a good thing to see for the industry. And finally, I want to uh, end with a sign on Einstein's wall. It's called the Metricator's Maxim. Not all that counts can be counted. Not all that can be counted counts or updated for my business. Not all that matters can be measured. Not all that can be measured matters. And then uh, one final thing. If you want to learn a little bit more about this, we have some free downloads off our website. One's a white paper called How to Read and Write Specifications. So if you want, hey, is this a good spec? Is it clean? You know, this paper will tell you if it's complete. And then we have something called the Audio Measurement Handbook, which is about audio measurements, but it's not too, it's engineering oriented, but it doesn't go crazy into equations and stuff. It's actually a quick read. Um, and we're also across the atrium in room 408. You can see our banner hanging down from the balcony. And there are six of us here who we'll, can answer or deny any, you know, Answer any questions, deny any allegations. <laughs> so uh, with that, thank you. A any questions? Any questions? Yes. Oh, we, we have some microphones. Uh, uh, make sure they're on. There's an on-off switch on. Down in the corner here. First great presentation. I'd love you. to see this chasm reduced because I tell you it's a pretty tough issue right now. I believe in measurements and the value, but I tell you people are starting to hate this stuff with a passion in high-end audiophile business. A um, couple of problems I've run into, and I, and I have one of your customers use the equipment just for reviewing. And I think from that point of view, I run into issues that don't run into if I was using them to design things. Okay. And one of the things I run into is that I don't use them every day. Ah. I get in there once a month or two, I want to test something, and I have usually a project. I get in there, and I'll tell you, there's a learning curve of what all needs to be set to do this measurement. I saw you run into that. You go in there, all of a sudden you're like, this doesn't make sense. But the worst one is that it makes sense. Like I'm measuring the noise floor, and I do all this analysis, then all of a sudden I look at it in front of the analyzer and the panel, and it's measuring the balanced input, and I had been using <laughs> the unbalanced input. This whole time I'm measuring a port, that has nothing hooked up to it. And I oftentimes I've started to uh, redo the work. So the comment there is that your user interface yeah. needs to flag and say, hey, you got this bandpass filter on. Normally that's not on when you're doing amplifier measurement. Tell me that I'm doing an amp measurement. And if the frequency response like this, it's probably something wrong in your setup. In case of AVRs, Odyssey's turned on into the th in the thing. Right, right. And it's completely acute, the thing. Right. Yet you can get a frequency response. Well. The instrument yeah. can say like this, you know, telling you, well, don't I, run with this. Actually, I, I didn't show you because the screen resolution was pretty poor, but in the corner, it actually tells me what all those settings are. And, and you know, I, um, but you, there's always the complexity where complexity. you give somebody more control and you reduce the usability. I will say this, though, that today's stuff, the usability is much greater than it used to be. I know we have some users here. And anyone, System 1, System 2 users... Uh, okay, and uh, now using APX, uh, okay, a few people have made the transition. Uh, most people that say that moving to APX has been a much uh, easier. Yeah, for sure, the, the, I have a system too, and it, okay. it's a lot more data. But I'm saying when I change parameters, just mark them with red or different colors saying, look, well, what you're doing, this is not normally done. Or something yeah. like that. If you want to come up to the suite and give uh, us some I'm recommendations. I'm definitely going to do that. Yeah. And the second part is, Try to bridge the gap between how something sounds and the measurements. And I take every measurement, then I sit there and apply psychoacoustics to it and say, all right, is this shit really audible at this frequency versus not? 
it doesn't take a lot to have that kind of overlay or that kind of analysis in there because I have to manually do it every time and say, is this important or not? Or put it in terms that people understand. So I've measured jitter at minus 90 dBFS. Is that good or bad? I, s I tell people, well, okay, see these noise floors at this level. Right. Oh, okay, now there's a reference that, that, for somebody that, that's, who that, Those are some good noise. suggestions, so, Steve. Anyway, but great job. Thank you. Uh, yeah, will you take the microphone? Oh, we have to wrap up. Okay, this will be the last question. I'm sorry. Okay. We can go upstairs or out in the lobby. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, again, great presentation, Jonathan. Um, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned uh, that you're uh, on some of the writing committees for standards yeah. and AES and so forth. The question for you is, uh, which new measurements, paper standards, might be uh, uh, um, in progress, and can we can we go out online and see anything about any of the new standards? That um, are in work. I, you know, there are some better standards out there. Not, I don't know of any currently that are working on the subjective issue. So I'm just like, how do you define one of the standards I'm on right now? How do we define the the um, amplifier power level so that we don't blow out speakers? And it's more related to oh. the, the maximum level. Okay. Y you know, so it's not about the enjoyment. It's just we oh. want to protect the speaker. Well, what I'd like to see, well, r real quickly, uh, you know, we're working with uh, distortion measurements that have been around since the 40s, and Tim's been around since the 70s. Um, what I'm interested in are uh, the committees developing uh, new uh, measurements for, for new kinds of distortion measurement, uh, new names for them, defined and so forth, new paper standards, mostly in the time domain uh, and uh, transient time domain, complex waveform category type stuff. Yeah, but so I, I think there's a lot of, like there's lot, that, no, I'm not aware of any in, in that area. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.